Okay, thank everybody for joining us once again for another wonderful program, part of the Chachma uh, Bacharov Winter Wisdom Initiative sponsored by uh, Ken and Allison Jacob. Thank you so much again uh, for uh, enlighten, allowing us to enlighten our community with all these programs. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I, I, would, I just want to introduce Trevor Fish that will introduce our speaker, Trevor Fish. Thank you, Rabbi Feigenbaum. Uh, good evening and welcome to everybody. Uh, from live from Studio 10167. Once again, we're very excited to host a uh, very exciting uh, speaker this evening. And as we've been um, featuring various interesting uh, people on their interesting journeys along this series of Winter Wisdom, and thank you again to Ken and Allison Jacobs for sponsoring. <clears throat> we're honored tonight to feature uh, Rochi Fryer from Brooklyn, New York, somebody whose uh, name speaks for herself, and hopefully we'll get to hear her firsthand about her journey. Somebody that's in uh, both worlds, both the Orthodox Jewish world and uh, the, the secular world, and uh, has uh, been a trailblazer as an Orthodox Jewish woman um, in, in both of her worlds. And uh, we're very excited to hear about her journey and, and be inspired from her story. So without any further ado, here is Rocky Fryer. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you to uh, Ken Allison Jacob for sponsoring the program. And thank whoever thought of inviting me, thank you so much. I absolutely love coming to different neighborhoods and meeting different people. One of the most fascinating things about meeting different people and from different communities is to see that while we're all different and we come from different backgrounds, by the time I finish speaking, what we all begin to realize is that we have so much more that binds us, that, that so much more in common than things that actually divide us and separate us. So I come from the Hasidic community. I grew up in Borough Park and my husband is a Bub of a Hasid. And um, I'm gonna try to share with you the past 30 years of my journey in about 30 minutes and allow you to ask questions. But every time I speak, it comes out different and I never go in chronological order. So you really have to pay attention. I also have to give a disclaimer. When I open the floor for questions, there are some topics that are just not allowed. They're banned from someone who's a judge on the bench. I cannot discuss politics, not this country nor any other country. And I can't discuss any court cases, any pending court cases here or any other country. But don't worry, we'll still have lots to talk about. So I think that um, people want to hear my story because they want to hear like, how did I get to where I am? And I always say I have the best job. I have the best seat in the house because regardless of which courtroom I'm assigned to, above me are the words in God we trust. And whenever anybody questions me, whether it's a decision or a policy that I'm taking, I always say, it's only God that I worry about. And when I come into the courtroom and I see those words above me, it always puts me into perspective. So let me just kind of give you just the heads up of my family structure, and then I'll try to rewind and share with you my childhood growing up, getting married and starting my family and to where I am today. And if you figure out how old I am by the time I finish, that's perfectly fine. So I have six children, Kenai Nahara. And if I speak any words in Yiddish or Hebrew, I will translate it. But thank God I have six children, three boys and three girls in that water, just like the Brady Bunch, but one husband. And at this point I could say, Praise God, I married off my youngest child a month ago. So they're all married, all out of the house. My, my three married daughters all are setting their um, homes up in Israel and the boys are home. The boys are here in Borough Park. So when I graduated high school, I was 17 years old. And back then in the early 1980s, there were no college opportunities for the Hasidic community. So someone like myself who went to an ultra Orthodox slash Hasidic school, and I wasn't going to be a rebel. I, I was proud of who I, of where I came from and it was never my intention to be a rebel or to break away. And there were no college opportunities and, but I wanted to make money. And what they did offer back then was a course called legal stenography, which helped the girls become secretaries for lawyers. And I figured I'll become a secretary and I was quite satisfied with that. I was content. Um, I married a young Hasidic Talmudic scholar, and I was going to support him while he was going to sit and learn and study the Talmud. By the time I turned 30, 
I felt it wasn't enough. By the time I turned 30, I said, I need more. I was restless. And at that point, colleges began to open up that cater to the Hasidic community. So one thing about us Hasidim is we're nonconformists. We don't change. But when opportunities change, we just jump on and make the best of it. So I did go to college at the age of 30. But I, my plan was that my family was not going to be compromised. I was going to stick to my values, stick to my traditions, make dinner every night, bake challah for Shabbos all the time. And I was going to do it slowly. So my undergrad, the plan was do my undergrad in six years. And then part-time law school was four years. So there we were, my friends and I sitting around the table, and I told them all on a Shabbos afternoon that my plan is, after being a legal secretary for so many years, I'm going to go and embark on a journey of higher education, and that it probably would take me about 10 years, but I want to become a lawyer. And they all laughed at me. Ruchi, they said. We're 30 now. And at that point, we thought it was over the hill. In 10 years, we're going to be 40. You want to be a lawyer when you're 40? And my journey is a series of naysayers trying to stop me every step of the way. Every step of the way, there was always someone who told me, it's never going to happen. It's impossible. It can't happen. But guess what happened, my friends? 10 years later, we all turned 40, and I was, in fact, a lawyer. So all, for all those people who said, you'll never make it through college, you'll never make it through law school, you'll never pass the bar, and then even if you did, who would come to you, a Hasidic woman from Barapak, who's a lawyer? And I'm going to try to share with you some of my challenges along my journey, the stumbling blocks, the naysayers, and what I had to go through. But now I'm going to rewind again. So I grew up in a very simple home. My parents are great parents, hardworking parents, not wealthy, not from any rabbinical dynasty, not from any politically connected party just hardworking parents. And my parents taught us the importance of working hard, that we were entitled to nothing. Now, my parents didn't push us academically. They were just too busy. So I would go to school. My mother was so busy, always working late at night. And if I would give her my, my exams to sign, all she would say is, well, you did the best, and she would sign it. So nobody should think by any stretch of the imagination that I was pushed to achieve and to excel. I wasn't. I was a very average student. In fact, a couple of years ago, when my youngest, who are a set of twin girls, were in the senior year of high school, had a PTA, I came into class and the teacher says to me, hey, Ruchi, I recognize you. I was in your sister Simi's class. I said, hey, Rivka, that's so interesting. Yeah, I recognize you too. And she says to me, did you become a lawyer? I said, I did. And then she says, you know, come to think of it, I don't remember you being one of the smart girls. And she was completely right. I was an average student. If I liked the teacher, I did better. If I didn't, I just didn't do so well. My father did not stress academics. To him, what was important was me dos tovos, good character traits. He would come into a PTA and he would say, how does my daughter behave? He really wouldn't care how we did academically. But my parents believed in us. I remember my father one year when I was still a legal secretary. My father thought I was a lawyer before I was a lawyer. He says, Ruchi, I was in Manhattan at the newsstand and I saw a magazine and it said on the cover of the top 50 lawyers in the country. And I bought it, Ruchi, but I didn't find your name inside. I said, oh, Tati, you're not going to find my name in such a magazine. But that's, what, that's the environment that I was raised in. I was really very lucky because I, my, my, my formative years growing up and developing as a child, we're going back to the 1970s and the 1980s. Now, back then, in the 1970s, we were valued for one reason. We were born. I was the oldest grandchild of Holocaust survivors. And my generation proved that Hitler, may his name be obliterated, Yamach Shemo was wrong. Because not only are there Holocaust survivors, not only are there children, but now they are grandchildren. Am Yisrael Chai Kaya. The Jewish nation is eternal. So we went to school. All we had to do was breathe. You inhaled oxygen. You exhaled carbon dioxide. And you were called Thai kin, precious child. And that was enough. But the, 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 real, the real point of what I want to bring out when, I, when, when I'm going to be speaking to you tonight really is that Thanks. I'm going to share with you I'm going to share with you 
something that really is very important to me. And the main theme of what I want to bring across to all of you is that we're all different. But inside of us, we have a soul. We have a neshama. And our neshama has that connection to God. Now, that connection to God is something that is important to each and every one of us. And what may be important to me may be different to you. We all have our different standards in Judaism. But regardless of what your standards are, that is important to you because that connects you to God. Don't think for one second that to be successful in the secular world, whether it's the academic world, the corporate world, the legal world, or even the medical world, don't think for one second that to be successful in these worlds, you have to compromise your standards because you don't. In fact, my journey proves just the opposite, that if you stay committed to your values, to your Judaic values that connect you to God, not only will it not hold you back, but it will propel you to success. And when I speak to young girls that are graduating high school or college, I tell them, the world is full of challenges and obstacles. And there'll be many times when you'll think, well, maybe just this time I should compromise my standards. Maybe this time if I do, I'll get the promotion or I'll get the job. But no, no, my friends, it's just the opposite. Because when you show people that you have your values and that you're non-compromising with them, the message that you are giving to your colleagues, your coworkers, your supervisors, is that you're a person of commitment, loyalty, dedication, integrity. And when they have a corporate secret or something very, very sensitive of information, who do you think they're going to trust if not the person who only eats kosher even when no one is looking? or the woman who runs home to light the Shabbos candles when no one is looking. This is what I have learned because the world wants people that they could look up to. The world wants people who have standards that are above their standards. And once they recognize that in you, they will not let you let go. And I have a couple of stories that I can share with you of what it means or what it meant for me now, when I want to share my journey and my stories with you, I'm going to share with you what it's like being a Hasidic woman. And as I navigated myself through corporate legal America. And of course, I don't expect any of you to don't think for one second that I expect you to take upon yourself the standards of the Hasidic community of Borough Park. But I'm just going to share them with you to illustrate what it was like for me to navigate through these worlds. So I'll tell you the story about what happened when I was doing an internship. So when I was in law school, everyone told me I'll never have any clients. And I loved real estate because when I was a legal secretary, I did a lot of real estate work. But the real estate people, they're the machers, the hawkers, the cloppers. And I figured they might not want to come to this Hasidic woman who's becoming a lawyer. So everybody told me, Ruchi, why don't you look into estate planning, trusts and estates, wills, because maybe the mature population won't have a problem coming to you. So I looked for an internship at a trust and, for, at a trust and estates firm, and I found one right across Brooklyn Law School, which is where I went. I knocked on the door one day, and I said, I'm here, I want an internship, I'm a law school across the street, and I got it on the spot. Now, I work for a trust and estates attorney. But the way the office was structured, there were several attorneys that shared the space. And I was assigned to a desk right opposite the door, the office of a litigator. I love litigators. Anybody here a litigator? Let me see anybody raising their hand. Who's a litigator? Litigators are assertive. They're zealous. And sometimes they just, they make a lot of noise when they have to advocate for their clients. So the litigator who, who's area I was sharing was not from the religious community. And I'm sure that the things that he said, he didn't realize that in Borough Park, we call that curse words. So there I am, here's Ruchi Fryer sitting at this desk and I'm right opposite, let's call him Joe, Joe's office. And Joe would be doing what we call in Borough Park, cursing all day. And I was in a big moral dilemma because my teachers, I went to Beis Yaakov, Beth Jacob School, 
My teachers taught us, girls, when you go out into the outside world, there'll be many, many temptations. And they taught us that there are three levels. When you are in an environment that you know is wrong, there are three different categories. So first, it's going to bother you. It'll bother you a lot. And you'll feel this is not right. But if you do nothing, then you'll go to the next level where it doesn't bother you so much anymore. And you kind of get accustomed to the practice. And if you still do nothing, girls, you will go to the lowest level, which is you participate and enjoy the behavior. So I thought to myself, what am I going to do? I'm opposite Joe's office. He curses all day. I got to put in the bud. And knocked on his door. And I said, Joe, you have a moment? Sure, Rachel, come in. I said, I really have to apologize. But this, I, I have a request to make. And it's, it's not about you. It's really all about me. And I explained my problem that I come from a very religious community. And I'm sure, I, Joe, you don't realize, but where I come from, we call that cursing. So can I ask you a favor for the one hour a week that I come in and before I finish my sentence and his big booming voice, he was a big guy, Joe gets up, everyone, when she's here, watch your language. And every time I came in to do my internship, everybody would say, here she comes, everybody. You got to watch what you say. So I said to myself, I'm not going to let these lawyers have the last laugh. I have to outsmart them. The next week I came in with a tzedakah, a charity box. And I said, guys, I have to create a disincentive to cursing. I'm going to put this tzedakah pushka, this charity box on my desk. And anytime anybody curses, you put a quarter in the pushka. So another lawyer, let's call him Steve, comes to me and says, Rachel, here's a $10 advance. And every time I would come in, they would have a good laugh. But let me tell you something. Years later, I came to visit that pushka was still there. So the point is, you can share with other people your standards. You can share with them what you will not compromise on. And you could make friends along the way and even sanctify God's name. I have a great story about prayer, about Davani Mincha. And you know what? I'll say it a little bit later in my presentation. And if I forget, please remind me to share with you my Mincha story. But I'll tell you a little bit about, about um, the time that I was tested with my, the rules of modesty. So in Hebrew, the word is tznias, and it means modesty. So in, in, in our community, modesty translates itself into so many different areas. It's the way we dress, the way we act, the way we speak, many different areas. Now, but the most profound is the way we dress. So my hair is covered, I wear a wig, I, I, wear, I wear long sleeves, I wear a long skirt. Now, at one point I had gotten a job when I was a legal secretary at a large firm in Midtown Manhattan. And it was a big law firm, one of the top, one of the top 50 law firms in, in the country. And it was the summertime. Has anybody here ever heard of Dress Down Friday? Dress Down Friday, but no, Dress Down Friday is? Well, at that time when I got this job, I had never heard of Dress Down Friday. So for those of you who don't know, Dress Down Friday is in the summertime. The large firms want to make sure that the staff doesn't feel like they're working so hard. And they allow you to come in on Fridays dressed down. You don't have to wear your stiff shirts and your ties and your suits. You could come more casual. Now, there were some rules. You couldn't come in shorts and flip-flops, but by and large, it was a casual day. So here I am from Borough Park. And in Borough Park, we like to dress up, not down. And every Friday, I would open up my closet. What am I going to wear today? What am I going to wear today? So back then, I had a denim dress. Now, I knew that for me, for Ruchi Fryer from Borough Park, the sleeves were borderline. It was the kind of dress that if I raised my arm, the sleeve would roll down. But hey, I'm going to work on Lexington Avenue and 53rd Street. Who cares about Ruchi Fryer sleeves, right? Or so I thought. Now, by the way, in today's day and age, there's something called a shell. And we wear them every day. These shells revolutionize the way we dress. They come in lycra, they come in cotton, they come in all different colors. And all you have to do is just invest in some shells and you're good to go. But back then it wasn't like that. If you had a dress that was too cut open, the neck, your neckline was, was too low, or your sleeves were too short, you went to the dressmaker and they had to fix it. 
So it was Friday and I'm wearing my borderline sleeve denim dress and I'm sitting at my desk and I'm at the computer. And I was assigned to work for three attorneys, three associates. They were all Jewish. They were not observant, but they were very, very proudly Jewish. And I really got along with them very well. So I'm sitting at my desk and I'm doing my work. And one of the attorneys, let's call him Sam, comes over to my desk and says to me, Rachel, I see your forearms. And he covers his eyes. I felt like I was punched in my gut. You know, when I was in school, we used to have teachers who were the modesty monitors. They would come around and inspect our hemlines, our necklines, our slits and our skirts. We didn't always like them. None of them ever impacted me like this young attorney who was not observant. Because the message that he was giving me was, I know you're observant. I know you're Hasidic and dressed modestly. And I'm sure you don't know that your sleeves are too short. I went home that Friday and I promptly threw out that dress. And the message is when people see that you have values, they won't let you let go because everybody wants to have someone who they can look up to. People always ask me, so Ruchi, who's your role model? When, when we did the documentary film, 93 Queen, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the documentary, but that's a documentary about the organization that I'm the director of. And it's the first all-female volunteer EMS organization called Azras Nashim. So 93 Queen was a film that was being done. And if I have a chance, I'll explain to you how I got myself stuck <laughs> in doing that film. It, I had no idea what it was like when I agreed to do it. But there I was doing the film, and after five years, there was the, 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 the premier film festival, the Hot Docs Film Festival in Canada. And this goes back to 2018. I'm sitting at a large secular audience. And then comes the big question, who is your role model? Is it RBG? Is it Golden Meir? And I say, no, none of the above. My role model was a very modest woman who lived in Krakow, Poland between the two world wars. Her name was Sarah Schneer. And we know her as being the mother of the Beis Yaakov movement. And Beis Yaakov is the name of the school that I went to. And my teachers were her students. She was the woman who, revo who revolutionized Jewish education for girls. Because back then, in the early 1900s, there were no schools for Jewish girls. Everybody went to public school. And after public school, the boys had a Rebbe, and the girls were expected to learn whatever they needed to know about Judaism from their mothers. During that era, which we call the advent of the isms, communism, socialism, Marxism was sweeping across Europe. And many of the Jewish children had left their religious background only to be swept away by these idealistic movements. And that's when Sarah Shanira said, if we don't teach girls about Judaism, we're gonna lose our daughters. So I grew up learning about Sarah Shanira. We sang songs about her, how she was a seamstress sewing clothes for the body while the souls remained unclad. But I never knew the real story about Sarah Shanira until I read a book about her life. The name of the book is Carry Me in Your Heart. And it was written by Pearl Benish, one of her students of blessed memory. When I found that book, I remember reading about her being considered a revolutionary, and I didn't know that. And I didn't realize that if you want to do something good, you need to know that there's going to be opposition. Because people have always asked me, Ruchi, how could you consider yourself Hasidic when you have a public persona? How could you consider yourself modest if you're going around doing public speaking? And for many years, I struggled and I tried to reconcile these two competing interests. But deep down, I knew that I'm doing nothing wrong, but I needed my role model. And when I read the book about Sarah Shanira, I realized this is my true role model. And one of the lessons that she taught her students, I repeat all the time, I call it the lesson of, of the two pockets. She taught her students that a Jewish daughter must always wear a dress with two pockets. I'm wearing a suit with two pockets today. And in one pocket, she tells her students, you carry in that pocket a verse from Psalms. King David writes in Psalms, Kol Bas Melech Prima, 
which in translation means that the honor and the beauty of a Jewish daughter is what's internal, not her exterior, her soul, what's internal to her, what, what, is, uh, what we consider modesty, that is what identifies her as a Jewish daughter. And she would tell her students, you carry your modesty, whatever it means to you, in your heart with your head up high and you be proud of it because this is what identifies you as a Jewish daughter. But in your other pocket, you carry another verse from Psalms, which King David writes, Esla, sosla Hashem. There comes a time to act for God because people have trampled Torah values. And girls, she said, you're going to get up, you're going to be leaders, and people will follow you. In the 1920s, when it was unheard of, she trained young, single Jewish girls to be teachers and founders of different chapters of the Beishakov movement. They would travel to far-flung shtetls, starting schools, and teaching Jewish daughters about Judaism. This is the age before you had telephones, smartphones, travel, when teachers were writing the notes by hand. And that's how she started the Beisyakov movement. Now, I like to say I have a profession, not a career, because profession seems to have a connotation that your family's on the back burner. And for me, my family always came first. It wasn't easy. People would ask me, how does this affect your children? And honestly, it really wasn't easy. Same thing for my husband. People would stop him and say to him, how could you let your wife do what she's doing? But I will say, and if it wasn't for the support of my husband and my children, I couldn't have achieved the point where I am today. Because let's face it, women, no matter how independent we consider ourselves, we really can't be successful without the support of the men in our lives. So for all of you men out there who support your wives, who support your daughters, who support the women in your life, thank you, because without your support, we wouldn't be able to manage. And what's interesting is all the naysayers had predicted that the more I travel in the outside world, the more I'm going to climb and achieve success in the outside world, the less committed I'm going to be to my Hasidic background. When in actuality, it was the reverse. Because the further out I traversed, the further out I went, the happier I was when I came home from work. I would get off the New York City subway. I'd get off at the 18th Avenue station in Bar Park, and I would say, thank you, God, for making this my home. And I would find that I would appreciate living in the Hasidic community, sometimes even more than those who never even stepped outside, because I appreciated what we have. And I don't take it for granted. I appreciate family. I appreciate tradition. I appreciate all of these values that can be taken for granted. The first two years that I was on the bench, even though I ran for civil court, I was assigned to Brooklyn Criminal Court. And I remember being interviewed by one of the famous speakers in Israel. Her name is Yemima Mizrahi. And she wanted to interview me during Parsh, by the week of Parsha Shoftim, the chapter about the judges. And she interviews me, she says to me, Ruchi, you are sitting in criminal court and you listen to the most horrific cases every single day. How do you manage not to bring your work home with you? And I thought for a moment and I pondered and I said, you know what, Rabbi It's really the reverse. I don't bring my work home with me. I bring my home to work with me. It's these Torah values that have been ingrained in me since I was a little girl that help me when I'm on the bench. The value of charity, tzedakah, chesed, compassion, MS, truth, mishpat, justice, all these Torah values and the commitment and the non-conformist approach of the Hasidim is what helps me and gives me the strength when I have to make a difficult decision. So, Getting back to the story about my Mincha story, I'll share the Mincha story with you, and then I'll take a break and listen to your questions, because I can continue talking till, till midnight. And I really want to make sure that when I speak, I'm catering to this particular audience. So let me share with you my Mincha story. 
So all along my journey, I had all the naysayers predicting that I was going to leave the fold. I wasn't going to stay. I wouldn't be committed. And so I, I pray three times a day. It's not a requirement for women to pray three times a day. The men have all those requirements. But I, I feel that when I, I have to just connect to God three times a day because I'm so seeped in the secular world. And when I graduated college, I realized that college was really an extension of high school. It was an all Jewish girls college. The professors were all Jewish. It really wasn't that difficult of a transition for me to go to college. But when I was going to start law school, I really started to worry. Are the naysayers going to be right? I'm going now into a very liberal academic environment. So I made my deal with God. Help me get through law school without compromising my values. And when your children come to me for help, I will help them. So I had to find a place where am I going to daven mincha, right? Because if you daven, if you pray or you daven three times a day, the morning prayers you could say at home before you start work. And the evening prayers you could say at night before you go to sleep. But the afternoon prayers, especially in the wintertime when the sun sets early, and it has to be said before sunset, where am I going to daven mincha? The other thing I, 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 I had to do was I was going to do outreach work. I was going to do outreach and I was going to do it independently of any other Jewish law student society. Every holiday, every Jewish holiday, I brought my kids in beforehand and I made a holiday, a festival, a celebration. Before Hanukkah, I came in with the latkes and dreidels. And before I make a masquerade. And before Passover, I made a, a Seder. I accept the whole Seder table. And I had the professors who were Jewish, but not religious, most of them, speak about how they celebrated the holidays growing up as children. And then when I was looking for a place to have a mincha, I asked one of the students that was graduating who was religious if she could recommend a place that's private. Because I'll tell you, my friends, I, I'm not embarrassed to pray in public. You'll see me in the subway station. You'll see me in the airport, the airplanes. It's time to pray. I take out my sitter and I pray. But I thought to myself, I'll be in law school for four years. And if I go to the law school library and I'm standing there with my prayer book and my lips are moving, I'll be self-conscious and I won't be able to have this, the right amount of concentration. So I wanted a private place. So one of the students recommended, you know, Rochi, she says, on the third floor behind the cafeteria, there is a staircase behind the staircase and no one ever uses that. So if you go there and you want to dive in there, nobody will see you. So for four years, I would dive in Mincha, I would pray in the staircase behind the staircase and nobody ever caught me there. And I did my holiday parties and I was able to maintain my standards all through law school. It was almost time for graduation. And I wanted to thank the security guards because every time I made my holiday events, they would help me with my props. They would open the back door for me. They would, they would keep the lights on for me, help me clean up. It was incredible how much these security guards helped me. So I go over to them and there were two African-American men. And I said, Clyde, I can't believe it's almost graduation. And I'm going to miss you guys after I graduate law school. Thank you so much for all the, all the times you helped me with my holiday events. And Clyde says to me, yes, Rachel, and we're going to miss you with your little book. My little book? What are you talking about? The law school books weigh more than me. What do you mean, Clyde? So, oh, we used to watch you every day on the security camera with your little book praying. I had no idea that the staircase behind the staircase was a fire exit of the security camera facing me head on for four years. So I thought I'm praying completely in solitude. I was being observed every day by those security guards. So my friends, when you do something for God, and it's a very, very private act between you and God, you never know who is watching you and how you can make a tremendous sanctification of God's name, a Kiddush Hashem. So let me take a break now. Let's pause. Let's see if I could answer a question or two, and then I'll pick up where I left off. If anybody has any questions, just some you can Go ahead, Ken. Oh, thank you, uh, Your Honor. It's uh, very inspirational as a litigator myself to hear you. Uh, 
I really, really enjoyed your presentation and I think it's inspirational to us all. Um, as you might imagine, Jacksonville is a much smaller Jewish community than <laughs> in New York and uh, very few Jewish managing partners in the traditional firms here. And I was just curious throughout your career whether you encountered any anti-Semitism uh, through your legal career. That's a great question about if I encounter anti-Semitism. So, you know what? I don't know if I would classify anti-Semitism or if I encountered people who were obnoxious. Because sometimes we think that it's anti-Semitism when actually it's really people are just being obnoxious and they don't know who you are, they, they're suspicious. So what I found was very helpful is I was very open about my observance and I would share. So on Friday, now the winter time, I leave early, right? And the other judges have to make up for my leaving early. So I would come in with some pastries, some challah, something to share my Shabbos with my coworkers. I wanted them to know that I appreciate what they're doing to help me observe my religion. And I'd be very open. I would encourage questions. So I found that that would really shatter any, any difficulties that I may have. You know, people who are like xenophobic. So sometimes we think it's anti-Semitism, when it's really just xenophobia. People don't understand us. They don't know us. I would invite professors to my house for a Shabbos. I would do outreach work with, with colleagues and coworkers. And I found that that always opened the door for friendship. And people then would just feel much more at ease. So sometimes I encountered situations where I had to leave where I worked. But I don't know if it was necessarily anti-Semitism, but just people who were just challenging people. But in terms of encountering anti-Semitic sentiments, which may foster and grow, the best thing is to share, be open. And it's amazing how many barriers get broken by being open and encouraging people to ask questions. Rina Shachar, I see your hand is up. I think someone posted a question about the SOS Nashim organization yeah. that I had started. So yes, so excellent question. How do I get involved with an EMS agency? My mind has always been law, law, not medicine. So if you remember I told you my deal with God when I started law school, dear God, please help me get through law school without compromising my values. And if I do that, when I graduate law school, dear God, please God, if your children need help, I will help them with their legal problems. And God wasted no time in testing me. Shortly after I graduated law school, I got involved with kids at risk in our community, primarily adolescent Hasidic boys. And it was my offer to help one woman with her son who was expelled from yeshiva after yeshiva to the point where he was violating the Shabbos and doing drugs. And that offer to help this one boy mushroomed where I was helping multiple boys and I would have like this kumzits in my house every Friday night for about 30 boys. I did it until it reached the point where I couldn't accommodate such a large crowd. And I actually had other people come in and help boys and start yeshivas for them. So I was able to take a step back. But I developed a name for myself as being an advocate in the community. And not long after that, I got a random phone call from a woman on a summer evening. And she said to me that there were, there were a group of women who were EMTs who were having a meeting that night. And they wanted to join Hatsala, which is a very reputable, strong organization of EMTs that have been helping the Jewish community all around the country, and all around the world, wherever you have Jewish communities for many, for decades. And I grew up knowing how amazing this organization was. It never occurred to me that women actually wanted to join. So I was wondering, should I go to this meeting? But remember, I had my deal with God, so I had to go to the meeting. And I remember thinking to myself, if these women are these like rabble rousers, troublemakers, I'm out of here. My husband and my kids have enough on their plate dealing with me, having a law practice, working with the boys at risk when I, I formed this organization called Bederach. So I went to the meeting and I met a group of women who make me look like I'm from the left, really devout high school principals, the mm -hmm. ones that have their their buttoned up all the way here. And they don't just cover their hair with a wig. They had the wig and the hat on top of the wig. Really, really religious, devout women. And I heard their story. 
of how when Hatzalah was first formed in the 1970s, there was supposed to be a women's division and 300 women were trained. And as soon as they started operations, some men from Williamsburg, Brooklyn said, it's not modest to have men and women working together. So the women's division was disbanded, but these women never gave up their dream of having a, an ability to help other women. So some of them continued to refresh their EMT licenses because they're only good for three years. Some became camp mothers, school nurses, and some just let their certifications lapse. At that time, when they called me, which was around 2011, the Square Rebbe, that's the Rebbe in New Square in Rockland County in New York, had integrated women in the Hatzalah of New Square. So the Brooklyn women said, now is our time. Let's get together again and let's form an, an, a part of Hatzalah. So they got nowhere. They weren't going to get accepted and they had severe opposition. And someone told them, if you really want to get your project off the ground, you need a woman lawyer who's going to work for you pro bono. And she gave them a list of a few female attorneys that were orthodox. And I was one of that list. And based on what I heard, I was the only one who returned the call. And I was totally unprepared for the opposition. First of all, I told them, I think it's a great idea. If I went to law school for this idea alone, it was worth it. But I, I'm a lawyer. I have to do research. I need evidence. Is it really necessary? If it ain't broke, why fix it? And I interviewed women who had stories of when they had emergencies, primarily emergency labor, and they had five to 10 men respond to the call and how traumatized they were. So I came from a point of modesty. For a woman's modesty and dignity, when she has an, an emergency where her modesty is compromised, she should have the ability to have a woman responder. Well, let me tell you, I had opposition that was fierce. They all said, this is Rachel Fryer's radical feminist agenda. Now, in Bar Park, that's a bad word. To call a woman a feminist in Bar Park was a bad word. And, and, and I kept saying, no, I'm not doing it because of women's rights. It's just that most of the time women are right, especially when it comes to our emergency medical care. And I just pushed and I pushed and I said, no, I'm not going to let these guys win this argument. They pressed the wrong buttons because the worst thing to do is to tell me that I can't do something because I'm observant, religious, and Hasidic. Oh no, I'm going to show you that I can do it. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to figure out a way to make this work. And let me tell you, everybody, this had taken me and it challenged everything that I believed in, that God runs the world, not man. If God wants something to happen, it's going to happen. You just have to believe and work hard and pray and ask God to help you. And you know, there is, there is an expression in Yiddish, what you do for others, you think you're doing a mitzvah to help somebody, you're gonna find out one day you did it for yourself. You're going to find out one day that that mitzvah you did to help somebody else is going to come back that's going to help you. Now, I told you that when I was elected as judge, I ran for civil court. I found out two weeks before the term started that I'm going to go be to criminal court. And I said, criminal court? You must be joking. What do I know about crime? I'm Hasidic. I don't go to the movies. I know nothing about crime. Don't worry, judge. We'll train you. Judge school was three days. Here I am sitting on the bench. I was doing arraignments. Arraignments, as looking at these arrested young defendants, a hundred a day was a normal number. And I looked at these, young, most of them were young men, young boys. I looked at them and you know what I saw? I saw the same pain that I saw in the eyes of the young boys that I counseled from the Hasidic community in my Bederek program. It was the same pain. These aren't bad boys, they're making bad choices. And I would connect with them. And I would tell them the same things I told these Hasidic boys. You can't give up on yourself. You have to believe you were created for a purpose. Roll up your sleeves, don't look back, look forward. You can't control who your parents are. 
but you have some control over your future. And I had grown men cry in my courtroom. But then when it came to the prosecution, the prosecutor would say, but your honor, what about the victim? We have photos of the injuries. I'm sure you don't want to see those photos. And I would say, I'm a paramedic. I'm an SS Russian paramedic. I want to see those photos. So there, I ha here you have it. My kids at risk mitzvah program and my EMT SS Russian mitzvah program is what helped me those critical first two years that I was on the bench. But you know what's, what was the best experience being a judge? The best experience is being a mother. Because we're judging, we're judging all day. All day we're judging. I once had an arraignment with a prosecutor and defense attorney, both women were arguing. And one tells the other, stop interrupting me. She can't hear us both at the same time. And I would say, counselors, I raised six kids. I can hear you both at the same time. But in any case, when I ran, when I decided to run for judge, it was a long story. It wasn't something that happened instantly. I wanted to become a lawyer and it took me 10 years to become a lawyer. And during that journey, I watched my uncle of blessed memory. I watched him go from a law student to a lawyer, to a clerk for a judge, and he became a judge himself. And he was my mentor. I spent many hours observing him on the bench. I always told him, Duvi, I'd love to be a judge one day. Well, one day he calls me up. Ruchi, he said, if you still want to be a judge, now is your only chance. I'm retiring this year, and you're going to have to run for my original seat because he first ran for civil court, and then he was promoted to state Supreme Court. And when he was going to retire, his original seat would open up. I'm thinking to myself, I have to run? I want to be appointed. But I realized from being a young Hasidic woman lawyer from Borough Park is not going to get you appointed by the mayor. You have to be in the DA's office. You, you don't just, you know, or, or the legal defense. You don't get just appointed like that. So I remember thinking to myself, I need to break this news to my husband and my children. Without their support, I can't do this. So it was just around sukkah's time, and we were all sitting around the sukkah table, and I'm coming in, and I'm serving the chicken soup, and I tell everybody, well, my uncle Duvi just called me, and he told me he's retiring, and he said that if I still want to be a judge, I need to run for his seat. It was complete silence. Everybody put down the chicken soup and the spoon, and my husband picks up his head, and he says, you want to be a lawyer? We'll get good health co insurance coverage. Go for it. And let me tell you something. From that moment on, my husband ran around doing whatever he could to get me on the ballot. Because my opponents, and when I say my opponents, my real opponents were the men who didn't want me to succeed in Ezra Asnashim. Those very powerful men, when they heard that I was running for, they got an orthodox man to run against me. And when the, when, when, the, when the word went out that the orthodox vote's going to be split, there was a non-religious woman who also wanted to be a judge, and she threw her hat in the race. So it was a three-way race. And everyone said I didn't have a chance. When I went to the party leaders to ask them for their endorsement and their nomination, they said, Rachel, we really like you, but we were told that a Hasidic woman could never win in Borough Park. I looked him straight in the eye, and I said, Judge, if God wants me to win, I am going to win. And he laughed. He said, you'll make a great judge one day, but the party did not nominate me. And we had to work really hard to get on the ballot, get signatures. You think I ran? The Fryer family ran. My kids ran around on the street corners with the long payas and the black velvet hats, holding up the flyers, vote for Fryer. This is my mama, vote for Fryer, it's my mom say your mother and they took my palm cards and they translated into Yiddish and my son had his friends come to my dining room it was like the war room and they made a list of every single shul every synagogue in Barapak mommy we're going to put these palm cards these flyers in Yiddish in all the shuls in Barapak Bob Satma, Papa, Bells, Vision, it's Klosenberg. Should I go on and get the drift and mommy he says to me we're going to put it where the men read in the bathrooms so if you think <laughs> I ran, if you think I ran for a judge, you're making the biggest mistake. It was the Fryer family. They even had a jingle, a campaign jingle made in Yiddish that was going around Barapak with American flags 
all around the street singing in Yiddish, vote for Friar on election day. So we did what everyone said was impossible. Not only was I able to maintain my standards and bake my challah for Shabbos and win the seat, I won over 40% of the vote. I think I won 41% of the three-way race. It was really just what I always say, if, if God wants something to happen, it's going to happen. You just have to work hard. You have to believe that we're created in the image of God, Elohim, which gives us such incredible potential. I have so many times people calling me and telling me, Ruchi, I'd love to be the EMT. I want to, I want to join, but you know, I can't take the course because I know if I, I, I won't finish it. I won't have time. And we learn in, in the Mishnah, in Perkei Avot, where it tells us, you don't have to finish the task. But the Mishnah goes on to say, you're not absolved from trying. Just because you think you can't finish, who says you can't try? You have to believe that you can do it. I love to share the story of Rabbi Zisha of Anipol. Rabbi Zisha was one of the earliest Hasidic rabbis, and he lived in the 1700s in Anipol. And on his deathbed, he's crying. And his students are saying, Rebbe, why are you crying? You're such a holy Jew. For sure, you're going to go straight to Gan Eden. And Rabbi Zisha is crying. He's saying, I'm not crying because up in heaven, they're going to ask me, Zisha, why weren't you like Moses? And I'm not crying because they're going to ask me, Zisha, why weren't you like King David? I'm crying because they're going to ask me, Zisha, why weren't you like Zisha could have been? We don't know our potential. We don't know what we're capable of achieving. I had naysayers every single step of the way. And anytime you want to do something that's worthwhile, you can count on naysayers telling you it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. But you have to believe that if God wants it to happen, it's going to happen. You just have to believe in your incredible potential that is part of your DNA because God creates each of us with incredible potential. We all have obstacles and the greater the goal, the greater the reward, the harder it's going to be. So if you want to do something and you find that it's hard, you should know that it's worthwhile. The story in Exodus of when Moses was born, you remember the story, um, Pasha Shemos? He was born at a time when it was a very bad time. The evil ruler, Paro, had decreed that all the baby boys have to be thrown in the river, in the Nile. And Moses' mother puts him in a little wicker basket. And as he's sailing down the Nile and he's crying, who else but the daughter of Paro, Batya, hears this baby crying in a wicker basket. Now, Batya knows that she's way too far from that basket. But what does she do? She stretches out her hand and God does the rest. God makes her arm reach that basket. And that's her name, Batya. She's able to reach that baby and the rest is history. How Moses survives and ends up being the savior of the Jewish people. So, I want you to know that you're all incredible and that you have potential and there's so much that you can do in terms of your own inner goals as well as sanctifying God's name and making God proud. I have a couple of minutes left for questions. So if anybody has any other questions or comments, please. Malky Gross, Malky Gross go ahead. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? okay? Go ahead. Sure. Okay. Uh, Ruhi, first of all, thank you so much. Um, I think you're a wonderful model uh, for so many of us. Um, I have a question though. Yeah, is your, uh, in the Hasidic community in Borough Park, are you a model now? Are more women looking up and saying, okay, there's a possibility for me in the Jewish community in Borough Park? Yes. And in fact, not just women, but men too. Because in Borough Park, the women have a better secular education than the men. So now the men are able to go to college as well. And they wow. come to me, they come to me and I, and I encourage them and I tell them, you be proud, you wear your pace and your beard with pride and you go to law school because when I was in law school, one of the best professors in Brooklyn Law School was Aaron Torsky from Barapak with his long gray beard and his long black coat. And he was very highly regarded and respected. 
So yes, and I've had interns every semester. I have from all different walks of the Jewish community, but I did have a couple of them from Borough Park, the Jewish grandmother, and I have a young Jewish high school student from Borough Park. So the message I tell these people is, you're coming here and you should know you have the opportunity of making such a Kiddush Hashem. I tell the young intern who wears skirts and dresses, I say, you should be very proud that you're wearing skirts and dresses because the other interns who are coming in pants don't know what you know, that this is the rules that we live by and it's not going to hold you back. It won't. Be proud of your beard, be proud of your payas and share it. Open the chumash. Show them where the, where the verse is, where it says you should not cut the corners of, the, of your hair. They'll be fascinated. You know, my story of Ezra Snashim, I had so many supporters who were very religious Christians who identified so much with our religious values that they helped me behind the scenes. So being proud of your religious observance is not going to hold you back. We live in a wonderful country. We have challenges all the time in, our, in, 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 in America. But at the end of the day, you if you stick to your values and you're firm and you're honest, and you're open and welcoming, you will be able to make a profound Kiddush Hashem. Rabbi Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. What you've said is absolutely profound. My question to you is, what dilemma have you ever had between Halacha Hashkafa and civil law? Okay, that's an amazing question. Thank you so much about the... Um, any contradiction between civil law and halacha. So actually the type of judge that I'm in right now, the courts I'm in right now, I don't have that contradiction. I don't have that conflict. Right now it's civil court. It's not anything about the bill of rights or certain values that perhaps would be contradictory to our values. But even if it would happen, I would do what's called, I would recuse myself. So I don't, I'm not allowed to preside over a case if I have a contradiction. There are other examples of when I would have to recuse myself if a former employee or employer were to be in front of me or a family member or relative who was in front of me, I would have to recuse myself. And there are plenty of judges in New York that would cover for each other when we have to recuse ourselves. But I have found that it's the religious values that I have that have only strengthened my resolve to be a fair judge and have actually laid the groundwork for being a judge as opposed to being a conflict. It is just a facilitator. It helps me think. And if I have questions, I'll speak to my supervisors and reach out to them. And there's always an ethics committee for judges also. So there's so much support. And I always tell these people, I grew up religious. We, we have a question we ask the rabbi. So you're my rabbi. Can I handle this case? How should I do it? How should I proceed? And there's a lot of support out there for people that go through these situations. So thank you for your question. Any thank other you. questions? Anybody else? Don't be shy. <laughs> so if anybody reminds themselves later or has a question that they're that are maybe too sensitive for the public, I'll share my email address. And it's very easy. It's rookiefryer at gmail.com. If you could spell Ruchi and you could spell Friar, then you'll find me. And I always love to hear feedback. So feel free to um, write to me, share your thoughts. And um, all in all, I can tell you that when you push yourself, you'll realize how much you're able to accomplish. And I'll just share with you uh, the film 93 Queen, because people want to always, people want to know and ask me, how did it come to be that I made a, that I was a subject of a film? So when we first started to get publicity at Ezra Snushim, I got an email from a modern Orthodox woman. It's very sweet. Her name is Paula Eisel. And she introduced herself to me as a young documentary filmmaker. And she said that she'd love to do a film about Hasidim that's a positive film that would portray us in a positive light. And she thought that Ezra Snushim would be a great story. And I said, I'm not interested. Oh, but Ruchi, you have to, because she says the Hasidim has such a negative, you know, negative image in, in the media. 
that if you let me come into your home and follow you, uh, it'll be such a great way to shatter the stereotype of Hasidim in general and women in particular, because they think that women that are Hasidic are just barefoot in the kitchen having babies. And I said, Paul, that's such a fantastic idea, but I'm not doing it because the risk to my family would be so great. But Ruchi, she said, if you let me do it, it'll be such a Kiddush Hashem. It'll sanctify God's name. I said, oh, Kiddush Hashem, that's my soft spot. If I can do something that'll sanctify God's name, let's go to the rabbis. We went to her rabbi and my rabbi, and they said, it's not even a question of Jewish law. There's no violation in doing a, a film. And if you'll do something positive, well, it should be with bracha, with blessing. And that's how 93 Queen came to be. I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but she said it would be a two-year thing, ended up being five years. Uh, my campaign for civil court judge happened to coincide with the film. And so much of what happened, we did not know what was going to happen. It was a documentary. Everything is in real time. Nothing was acting. And I think that was God's way of setting the record straight. So no one should say in 30 years from now, it didn't happen. Yes, it happened. And I've seen the impact that the film has had on so many people who didn't really know what the community is like here in Borough Park. We're not monolithic. We have diverse opinions. We're not all the same. And women are go-getters. Not everybody will have a public persona like myself, but we're, we're go-getters. We do what we want to do. And um, we make we make great strides. So SS Nashim is an amazing organization. I learned so much about myself. And um, we're growing and we're, we're getting stronger and stronger. So, so much for all of the women out there who have really supported us. Thank you so, so much. Uh, a big round of applause for Rochi. Thank you so, so much. Um, and uh, we're very honored to have you. Uh, honor Rochi uh, Fryer. Really, really uh, very you. inspirational. Um, as Rochi said, feel free to reach out to her. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, we have another wonderful program starting in the beginning of February. Uh, it's two months, two weeks in February, starting February 7th uh, and the 14th. So there's Sunday mornings and March 7th and the 14th. Uh, with Kent Spiro, um, and it's a history course on a nation that dwells alone. So please uh, join us for that. Uh, the, the you muted yourself. Thank you. The link is the link is on the chat. So please feel free to uh, register for that. Also, this week we have our musical Abdallah. So please uh, go ahead onto our website and uh, register uh, to make sure that you have a spot there. Uh, and again, thank you everybody for joining us. And a big thank you to Ken and Alice and Jacob for once again sponsoring our program. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. That was terrific.